A new ruling class has arisen in the richer nations of the world. These men and women answer mostly to themselves and very few outsiders completely understand the work they do. These guys are really more powerful than the people in government, more than a president, more than a prime minister. Once every few months they meet in Basel, Switzerland. There, hidden away from public sight, they coordinate an unprecedented global economic agenda. Have people ever tried to explain that to the broad American public, that there's this club that meets in Switzerland and does all kinds of interesting things, like affecting their lives, but we're not going to tell you about them because it's too complicated? Give me a break. They are the world's central bankers, and they are generally credited with having rescued a world that was melting down just five years ago. I think they have more credibility than politicians. I doubt if we've ever had a combination of people that are any better equipped to wrestle with these problems. But they've also punished an entire generation. What they've done is take money from people who have been really careful all through their lives. In the process, they've also taken the entire world into the unknown by exercising a power that they alone possess, conjuring unimaginable amounts of cheap money. Most prominent amongst them are Ben Bernanke of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Mario Draghi of the European Central Bank, and Canada's Mark Carney, soon to take over the Bank of England. The central bankers have changed everything for everyone, everywhere. For decades, central bankers surfaced only sporadically, usually moving interest rates up or down a touch. Don Johnson spent years as a Canadian cabinet minister. He remembers visiting central banks. And by and large, it was like walking into a big library. There was no panic, no activity. They were like firefighters in a sense that, that, you know, unless there's a fire, you don't hear a lot about them. And you don't see a lot about them. We had a big fire. Now, to be fair, the central bankers never asked for all this immense power they exercise nowadays. It was thrust upon them back in 2008 when the financial system collapsed. Turns out the elected politicians had neither the nerve nor the support to do what had to be done. So the central bankers stepped in. First they flattened interest rates. Then they began printing vast amounts of money. They called their program quantitative easing. And it did stop the meltdown. But you cannot unleash forces that powerful without provoking consequences, intended and unintended. The British are a nation of savers. There is more money in British pension funds than in the rest of Europe combined. Dr. Ros Altman managed pension funds in Great Britain for years. I think there is this general ethic of self-reliance and thrift that permeates through British society. That's supposed to be a good thing. It was always to, considered to be a good thing. It was the way most British people were brought up. A whole generation of Brits believed that if you saved and if you were prudent, you'd get a decent return on your savings someday. But in Britain, pension benefits are directly tied to interest rates on government bonds. And the British Central Bank's aggressive quantitative easing, its money printing, has depressed those interest rates to nearly nothing. This year, pensioners like Judy White and her husband Alan began to receive grim letters from their pension funds, notifying them of deep cuts to their benefits. I don't understand what quantitative easing is, except that it's printing money. But I do understand that I now have 50% less as a result of something called quantitative easing. Punishing savers was a deliberate trade-off. The central bank wants to encourage spending and lending right now, not saving, even though foolish spending and lending caused the problem in the first place. 
and we won't actually be out of the Paul Fisher is a member of the powerful committee that creates money at the Bank of England. He concedes the paradox. We're trying to get people to do things now to get out of the mess, which in the longer run we'd probably prefer them not to do. Part of the problem in the crisis was that people weren't saving enough. Um, but at the moment, to try and get some growth back in the economy, which is the immediate imperative, we're trying to get everybody to spend more. Um, and that is a paradox. It is hugely dangerous. This policy is a monumental monetary experiment. Roz Altman says the central bankers have in fact engineered a massive transfer of wealth from the old savers to young borrowers. The Bank of England itself says quantitative easing has cost savers and pensioners in Britain about a hundred billion dollars so far. So anybody who was a saver and has got some accumulated savings will have had a reduction in their income. Anyone who had big debts, particularly mortgage debts, will have had an improvement in their income position because their interest payments would have gone down. Judy White is keenly aware of Mark Carney's imminent arrival at the Bank of England. She'd love to talk to him. Please, Mr. Carney, look at people like me and say, you done a good thing, girl, and we're going to protect the sort of people that you are. Judy's husband, Alan, an artist, is just forlorn. Because we don't get a, a, a terrific um, explanation of what is happening by printing loads and loads more money. They haven't told us, really. They're just doing it. I don't totally understand it. Do you understand it? White isn't the only one asking. Quantitative easing has disrupted pensions and RRSP-type plans worldwide, and, of course, their payouts. Mark Carney has not ordered any money printing in Canada, but he has kept interest rates down, and he defends what the other central bankers have done. So there's no secret um, cabal here that... Um, is, is orchestrating things. This is the monetary policy as it's conducted today. You can understand the anger of an older person who, is, who has been a saver and a, or who has a pension who would draw a straight line from quantitative easing and low interest rates to his or her own decline in wealth and, um, and, and change in circumstances. I, absolutely. I, I can understand the, uh, the, the frustration of that, yes. But the question clearly is a sore point with Carney. And, you know, there is, a, there is a logic to some of your questioning, which is that wouldn't it be better if interest rates were really high, regardless of the consequences? You want to talk about unintended consequences. I'll give you intended consequences of that scenario, which is let's get interest rates back to historic levels so that the money you saved, I mean, if this is this all about you, Neil, is about the money you saved and the, and the return on that in your, in your bank account is going to be commensurate with what you expected. And we have double-digit unemployment in this country. We have people losing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people losing their homes, um, their businesses, because we have deflation. That, in essence, is the argument of all central bankers today. For all the consequences of quantitative easing, the world would be a lot worse off without it. And that people like Judy White just have to understand that their pain is part of the solution. But the impact on savings and pensions is just one troubling result of quantitative easing. It's also created an addiction to cheap money. Governments now rely on it to finance their out-of-control borrowing and spending, and consumers have taken on a staggering amount of personal debt. Some economists compare the cheap money to crack cocaine, and they ask what will happen when the drug is taken away. Experts tend to agree that stock markets are at all-time highs, not because of vibrant growth or the performance of the companies, but because of all the cheap money flowing into Wall Street. And 
real estate is at nosebleed levels in places like Toronto, Vancouver, London, Berlin, and New York City because of artificially low interest rates. Look, we're watching the long bond right now. It's at a three and a quarter. You're breaking through the technical highs. You can see. Mark Grant watches it all from his mansion in Florida. He's something of a financial oracle. He advises some of the biggest investors in the world, and he says they know they're rising on a tide that is not real. But here's the problem. The underlying economy that would normally support this isn't there. So it's a false kind of uh, buoyancy, a false kind of tide that everybody's riding and everybody keeps playing. We have now the entire world in a bubble. Every asset class, everything you can think of, real estate, uh, the stock market, the debt market, everything is in a bubble, and something is going to prick it. Okay, so... Grant was one of the first to blow the whistle on Greece and other Eurozone problems. He now issues constant warnings about quantitative easing. Just keep your eye on that. And what do you tell your clients? Be safe. <laughs> I tell them to be safe, be prepared, and fine, play the equity markets, fine, play the com compression in the bond markets, but be ready because you're going to have to move very quickly when this reverses. William Grider, who's made a career of writing about the U.S. Federal Reserve, agrees that the central bank's cure may turn out to be a disease. The more the Fed tries to help the real economy, the more it boosts the stock market. And so if you, if you listen to the bears, and I mean the market bears, they're already very nervous, not about inflation, but about the possibility that the stock market investors are going to wake up to this reality and say, I think I'll get off the merry-go-round before it collapses. Is there... A good ending in all this? Probably not. There's less bad endings, but probably no good endings. Is it fair to say the party's going to come to an end? Uh, I'm not sure if we're having a party right now, Neil, but it uh, um, doesn't feel like a party, does it, given, the, given your, your questions? Um, the, um, if I had a lot uh, of... If I had a a central bank, by the way, central bank and party are, you know, it's normally doesn't, doesn't go. I had a big portfolio with stocks and with Dow 14.5, I feel like it was a party right now. Well, it depends when you bought them, Neil. Certainly, Kearney is right in one sense. There is no party across the Atlantic Ocean. When we come back, Europe's nightmare. If the trillions printed so far by the European Central Bank have done any good, it's not obvious. Most of the continent is in recession, and it's just getting worse. In some countries, unemployment is at depression levels. I, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't venture... So, last summer, Europe's main central banker, Mario Draghi, issued this vow. The ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. Most people took that to mean even more money printing. But Germany's powerful central bank regards monetary easing as sinful and potentially disastrous in the long run. So, when banks in the tiny nation of Cyprus began to sink under their debts, Cypriots discovered they'd become the testing ground for a shocking new policy. On the 16th of March, the European Central Bank launched a bomb across the Mediterranean, and it landed here. No longer, they declared, were they willing to fund bank bailouts the way they'd done in Spain and elsewhere. Either Cyprus's government agreed to confiscate its people's private bank accounts, or the country would be left to strangle. Basically, 
the central bank have decided that Cyprus was not too big to fail. Suddenly, Cypriots found their bank accounts had been taken over. Withdrawals were capped. Pushed by Germany, the European Central Bank had ordered a multi-billion euro money grab. The initial public anger soon morphed into a Mediterranean fatalism. What can an ordinary person do when life's basic assumptions change? Chris Drake and David Simmons are amongst the many expatriates who moved here hoping to stretch their retirement savings just a bit further. Now I'm restricted as to what I can take out, what deals I can do. So we're being dictated to by these ECB, these European bankers, as to what we can do with our cash. This was the justification for destroying our economy. Meanwhile, elected Cypriot lawmakers like Nicholas Papadopoulos began to understand the extent to which power had shifted. It's been quite a night, hasn't it? Far away, unelected technocrats most people can't even name were now making up new rules, pressured by politicians who think money printing has gone too far. Why can somebody now not fear? Uh, wouldn't somebody fear that his deposits are, are, aren't safe if he lives in small countries like uh, Luxembourg or Malta? Uh, Weaker countries, financially weaker countries like Spain, Portugal and Greece know that uh, their deposits are not safe. It's an issue beyond Cyprus. It concerns the whole of the Eurozone. We all thought Chris we Drake all and his mate have a more urgent question. I was hoping you would have brought Mark Carney with you so that I could ask him what I should do with my money. Because who else do you ask? Frankly, I have no idea what to do. Where are you safe anymore? Under the mattress. I mean, seriously, you're... If I've got X amount of money, I can't trust anyone to put it anywhere. Might as well have it with me. But you're only going to be allowed to put it under the mattress in dribs and drabs, <laughs> yeah. a pillowcase at a time. Yeah. Ooh, I should be so lucky for it to be that big. The fact is, Europe continues to sink. The UK isn't doing much better. Money printing has not kick-started vibrant growth. Pressure is now building for Europe's central banks to try something new. Ross Altman suggests that England's central bank simply start sending the money it creates directly to the people. I think it would have been far more effective in stimulating growth if that is what you want to do, and we are told that is what QE is all about now. If you had sent a time-limited check that must be spent by a certain date to every household rather than buying government debt and artificially distorting government bond market. In America, where the Federal Reserve is now printing $85 billion a month, politicians are telling the public that a recovery is underway so they can start spending again. That's a great misunderstanding, if not a, if not a uh, deliberate lie, that the economy has not come back. That's the government... William Grider wants something even more radical. He wants the central bank to start directly funding massive job creation schemes like rebuilding the nation's roads and bridges. But here we are in a very similar crisis, not yet as severe as the 1930s, but still in the danger zone. And I'm one of those few crank voices that says now is the time for the Federal Reserve, arm in arm with the elected government, to build a program of serious stimulus to real economic activity. But the central bankers are holding firm and holding together. Quantitative easing will clearly continue and interest rates will stay low, at least for now. It's like a doctor is trying a new medicine. The patient isn't recovering. Most doctors would then look for a different medicine, but this group is doubling the dose and when that doesn't work, it's doubling the dose again. Don Johnson is much more willing to trust the central bankers that he admires. But even Johnson adds a caveat. I'm relatively confident. I don't lose sleep over it now, as I did. Um, I think that we're on the right track. Basically, you're hoping they're right. Hoping. Well, of course, I'm hoping. <laughs> the trouble is, they've shown themselves capable of being wrong. Most of the economic forecasting by central banks in recent years has been well off the mark. 
In other words, they've been acting on mistaken assumptions. The central bankers do concede they will at some point have to stop printing money and allow interest rates to rise. That can be managed safely, they say, but not anytime soon. You're still fixing things, is what you're saying. But, uh, clearly, yes. Ultimately, you know, history will judge whether we got this right. But I think the consequences of this are, are, are positive. This is, this is the way it should be done. So, the message is trust us. But keep this in mind. Central bankers are bound by their own mandates to say whatever they think is necessary to maintain stability. As their own forecasting has shown, reality is uncertain. And it's simply impossible to know how this massive monetary experiment will end. A recovery or a reckoning. For CBC News, I'm Neil MacDonald.